uh, first Deputy Managing Director, David Lipton. So thank you, David, for doing this with me, and thanks to all of you for being here. So the title of this 45-minute session, and we have a lot to cover, is new challenges facing the global economy. And I frankly thought we had plenty of old challenges. We do, that's true. <laughs> um, and we covered some of those last year. Um, but this is a tricky year. Next year is going to be a tricky year. We started 2008 uh, in a pretty good place, but then we had a global growth slowdown. We've had uh, financial conditions tightening in some places. We've had trade tensions. We have corporate debt, which the IMF has told us uh, is making parts of the world, large swaths of the world, actually very vulnerable and could really uh, ricochet problems that could evolve in the future when there is a slowdown. So before we get into all this and some of the larger structural mid and long-term issues, which I think you've got a lot of very interesting views on. Just give us a lay of the land. Give us sure. a little bit of the uh, the world economic outlook as you see it now, uh, immediate challenges and future challenges. Sure. Well, it's good to see everybody here. Welcome. I think even when we talk about the world economic outlook now, we have to be very cognizant of the new challenges. I think there's an interaction that from here on in is going to be unavoidable. You know, all of you, uh, I'm sure, have heard us speak about our outlook, which is that growth is, uh, has slowed, and where last year 75% of the world economy was growing more rapidly than the year before, this year 70% of the world economy is growing more slowly than last year. So that's a peaking out. We're still projecting growth, but the new economy issues come in when you start to look at the risks. There are new things happening that we haven't seen for a long time. The trade tensions are a major risk, and how trade relations will evolve are a major risk. I'm not sure we can be comfortable that a year from now the trade tensions will all uh, be resolved. There are, other, there are others uh, as well that are a bit more traditional. It is new, however, how high debt levels are. Sovereign debt, corporate debt, those are vulnerabilities uh, we haven't seen at least for a very long time in some uh, cases, in some categories since the 80s. Um, so we have to manage all of, the, all of those risks. We're not projecting recession, but with risks uh, of this kind, we're saying it's a delicate moment. Now, why is this um, so important? Why are we so concerned? I don't want to just be negative, but I do think we have to worry about the possibility of recession coming as a result of some of these risks. And that's where I think the, the, the new situation comes in. Usually, when there's a recession, we know what the response ought to be. Expansionary monetary policy and counter-cyclical fiscal policy. And if there are problems with banks, we have learned over the years how to fix them. But I, I fear, and I think it really is a, a major consideration, that the, that the advanced economies of the world will not have the potency of policy weapons to deal with a downturn, whether garden variety or worse, if it's a, a, serious, uh, a serious crisis, um, because of the, what's happened since the global financial crisis. We've evolved to a situation where monetary policy makers already have very low interest rates. The Fed usually re responds to a a recession with 500 basis points of easing, nobody has that right now. So, in, in, in fiscal policy with, with the high debts uh, uh, of government indebtedness, uh, while there'll be policy space, there may be a political reluctance to use that space. So, that's the, the, inter, the intersection here between the old and the new is that because of the present state of the world, the evolution of the world, we really ought to be much more careful to try to prolong the growth we have, uh, that which is why we've entered these meetings with the messages, do no harm and do some good. Okay, that's a good scene setting. Let, let me um, take the topic of monetary policy for a moment, because actually I, I see that The Economist has a very interesting cover on um, the political issues surrounding central banks and some of the pushback that the, the central bankers around the world are getting, uh, political pressures. We're seeing that in the U.S., we're seeing that in the ECB. Um, you're seeing actually a kind of a, a new push for central bankers to do more at a time when, you, as you say, they may be out of ammo. What is that going to do to stability? What do you think the, the right directions are, both re at a regional level but also a global level? 
I mean, we've always said you've got to use all the tools. And I think if there was an error in the re reaction to the global financial crisis, not in its first year, but over the way it evolved, it was that there was an excessive reliance on monetary policy. And we, you know, clearly this time around, uh, monetary policy makers, if there is a recession, we, look, we know there's a recession looming somewhere over the horizon. I hope that's an, quite a number of years away. But whenever it comes, uh, I, I, I suspect monetary policy makers will not be able to uh, be the sole responders. Mm. And so we have to think about how to be resilient and how to prepare to be resilient, um, and then uh, how to use all the tools that we have. Let's talk a little bit about trade. Um, the U.S. and China may be cutting a deal at some point soon, but you've mentioned that you think it's unwise to suspect that all trade tensions may be gone in the next six months to, the, to a year. You've also mentioned that we may be heading for a kind of a reset of globalization that isn't temporary but permanent, and that some of that um, is protectionist, but that some of it may be necessary. So maybe you can kind of tease yeah, some of sure. that out for us. You know, I think we've seen a discontent around the, um, the, the impact of trade and probably technology that's led to populism and political uh, movements. And that's understandable. I would hope that, you know, it's the job of the IMF to promote global integration and connectedness because our members really need that in order to, especially developing countries, in order to have good growth prospects and to raise standards of living. And while I think, you know, we should be, I think, in fact, people have over, overestimated the, the negative impacts of trade, there surely have been, especially in advanced economies, winners and losers. And the dislocations uh, that uh, come from trade, to some extent, um, continuing resentment around the way in which the global financial crisis impacted people, has led to this discontent and all of this political change. Now, in the face of it, I think what we risk is that countries turn inward and are focused more on how to use domestic policy to protect their own people. Now, it's no um, novelty that uh, countries uh, will, will care about their own interests. Putting your country first is not a new uh, idea, but it's been for decades that there was a coincidence of promoting your country's interests and promoting uh, international integration and multilateralism because everyone was gaining from it. It was a positive sum game. That's not to say trade liberalization was ever a slam dunk or was easy. It was always contentious. There were always winners and losers. But in the end of the day, integration won. And now it's not so clear. And I think we're seeing that the, uh, the uh, uh, concerns that are turning people inward may be inconsistent with uh, strong enough support for global integration. That, if it leads to fragmentation, would really be a problem. So I think it is a job of the IMF to uh, contend with those, let's call them old-style forces of fragmentation. Well, so in a world in which you've got a lot of different vectors uh, pushing some of the regionalization, uh, you've got nationalism and protectionism and populism, negative forces, but you've also gotten certain, um, I think, legitimate concerns about political risks, supply chains, uh, labor in specific countries, and, and how to uh, knit it together at a more local level. You've got some countries saying, you know, industrial policy is a good thing, and we want to we practice it, even in rich countries. Yeah. What do you say to all those concerns? Well, I should have said, you know, I'm not, when I said, when I made the comment about putting your country first, I don't think, it is a, this is an expression the U.S. is using, but uh, whether it's uh, what the U.S. is saying and doing, whether it's Europe promoting national champions or whether it's China's uh, policies under the China 2025, this is, a, this is a broadening phenomenon. I think the answer is that we have to start thinking about how best to take account of uh, domestic um, concerns and how to um, have policies that can uh, provide equal opportunity, deal with uh, the, the, the disadvantaged, uh, help people feel as though they're not um, 
the, 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 you know, losing when others are gaining so much with the rising inequality. But to design ways to do that that are not inconsistent with the continuation of global integration, I think that's going to be a, a tall order. We've been talking about uh, that uh, for some years in, in, at the fund, but I think the truth is there's been very little progress in redesigning domestic policies in a way that uh, provides better health, education, retraining, uh, infrastructure that will uh, make the, the whole economy more dynamic so that there, there isn't such a stark divide between uh, winners and losers. We need to take that more seriously. Well, so tell us where you think the low-hanging fruit is, um, because you know in many countries you've got a, a, a situation right now where maybe business is pushed for tax cuts, the public sector is starved, there's rising corporate debt. Nobody wants to spend. Everybody kind of agrees. Yes, we need to revamp education. Yes, we need to build infrastructure. But you know, aside from um, some state-planned economies, you, you, it's not so easy to make those investments. So yes. where's the? I, I don't believe that that. Uh, this will be easy. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, many advanced economies really have to think hard about the uh, composition of their budgets. And, and it, it, will re it will require some rethinking. We need more growth-friendly uh, fiscal policy. Some of it's reasonably easy. I think uh, the w building infrastructure, certainly doing the maintenance and building infrastructure is win-win. It's been uh, something that uh, should have been done in most advanced economies, uh, certainly here in the United States, on a much more um, uh, substantial basis. Uh, this administration's talked about infrastructure, and I think it would be useful to, uh, to act on that. There are other things, though. I mean, uh, in, in some countries, uh, having uh, more support for research and development, uh, since that, in a sense, will generate an externality of technologies that everyone can gain from, first domestically, but eventually uh, internationally, uh, that's something uh, that would be important uh, as well. Um, you know, I, I don't want to suggest that the only issue is the social dimension. We are also hearing, and I think uh, with reason, from emerging market countries that in this world of uh, changing capital market sentiment, capital waves of capital inflows and outflows, they're vulnerable to spillovers. And so there's a second, a second area for uh, all of us in the community and those of us at the IMF too to be thinking about is what policy mix uh, will al allow countries to protect their macroeconomies. Mm. So you need to protect the, the, the macroeconomy and the social economy. So we're open to some rethinking of how you, you combine monetary policy, foreign exchange rate policy and intervention, macroprudential policy and capital controls. Uh, if, there's, if, there's, uh, if there are recipes that are appropriate to countries that are adversely affected that would allow them to keep their economies on a more even keel, mm. uh, we ought to all be working toward that. I want to go back to um, some of the new patterns that we're seeing in trade, some of the new alliances. Um, you've got China with the One Belt, One Road plan. You've got uh, Europe, as you pointed out earlier, thinking about national champions, potentially industrial policy in some areas. Uh, you've got the U.S. administration putting pressure on, say, the Europeans over which telecom providers they're going to use. I mean, you do yeah. seem to have these sort of tripolar um, fights developing. Um, how do we think about this? How do you think about this? Again, where are the solutions? Where are the bright spots that, that people can focus on? Now, there are political angles to this that really are not uh, something the IMF can get involved in uh, about the, uh, the role of the U.S. in the world, the role of China in the world. I want to take a step back and look at how um, the technological change and the companies that are using technology may also be generating forces of fragmentation that we won't be able to stop, that rather we'll have to live with. One, of course, is that the, the, big, the big internet companies are um, big, and uh, different countries will have different attitudes about whether there are antitrust violations, whether competition policy should swing into action. And if the policies towards competition or trust are different from place to place, there may be a different treatment of these companies. They may have different ability to operate in different places. Secondly, we know that they've, these companies, some of these companies have turned uh, data into a business. I think you wrote in an article that uh, 
if data is oil, then the United States is the new Saudi Arabia. It's a clever line. I wish I'd thought of it. Um, but now we see that different countries have different attitudes towards data privacy, data ownership, data custody. In China, the view is uh, it's the government's business to have access to all the data. In Europe, there's a, a, a directive that uh, really tries to protect individuals' data. The United States is still talking about it. We may see different laws and regulations around data that then lead to segmentation or fragmentation uh, among the companies that use data. And then third, and I think in a way the, the, the one that uh, could be the most troubling, uh, is about cyber security. Um, just uh, as, a, as a general point, the more there's an internet of things and all goods have, uh, are connected to the internet all the time. I mean, right now your BMW already communicates with BMW to say how, you're, how well you're driving and what your fuel economy is. But eventually, everything you own is going to be connected to the internet. The glass windows in the building is connected to the internet. And that provides uh, vulnerability. We've seen an example of the kind of difficulty this can cause just two weeks ago when the US suggested to Germany that they not accept the Huawei 5G technology. Now, you could paint this as a, um, a commercial matter, but I would note that Australia has also said it won't use 5G technology, uh, Huawei 5G technology. So I think there really are genuine security considerations that go beyond any commercial considerations, or at least in addition to those. But well, what does this mean? In essence, the US, I think, is saying you've got to be part of the, the US 5G club or the Chinese 5G club. And you know it'll probably be three, four, or five years before we have 5G. But once it's there, as I understand it, many, many goods and services will make use of it. And so there'll be a connection between the network you choose, the technology you choose, and an awful lot of the goods and services that you buy and sell. So there is some risk, I think, of a world that's fragmented all along the lines of 5G technology. Now, we, we can argue that there shouldn't be trade tensions and that there shouldn't be f fragmentation because of uh, different uh, regulatory treatment of banks and so on and so forth. We can try to push back against that. But I think we may have to accept that because cybersecurity is so important and cyber vulnerability potentially so costly, that there may be some fragmentation along this line that we'll have to learn to live with. Okay, so you're raising an interesting point, which is we may be headed for, let's call it a splinter net, however the splinters may go, um, at a time when trade in traditional goods and services has been flat or falling for the last few years, and digital trade is burgeoning. It's up you know, 45 times in the last decade. It's probably going to grow similarly. What would that mean for global growth if we did see either a, a, a bipolar or a tripolar situation in terms of how the internet is run, how uh, data can be transferred, how 5G uh, works? It's hard to say. We have done some fairly rudimentary simulation that shows, it's, it's very hard to estimate what happens to growth. But one thing that it shows, if you, um, if you imagine a breaking up of the world into three uh, parts, um, the, the thing that's clearest is that trade goes down. That, you know, if, the, if there are, in essence, barriers to trade between the groups, then global trade goes down. Now, you know, there may be some winners and losers within each block because if you've dismantled supply chains, you have to rebuild them within your block and, and someone who played no role in the global supply chains may gain. But I think it's quite clear that uh, this would hurt global growth, it would impair global trade, it would lead to uh, needless uh, repetition, lack of exploitation of comparative advantage. Uh, it's something to be avoided and I think uh, uh, in time, uh, you know, when, as we apply analytics to this, uh, that will be uh, the finding that we have. In terms of trying to kind of knit the world back together, um, you've, you're seeing a number of countries, uh, Australia, Japan, Europe, the US, trying to come together to come up with new um, rules around data flows. Um, are there other areas that you see that are ripe for collaboration that people aren't jumping on yet? What I'm, I'm looking in some of this for some bright spots to, to focus on. Well, I think it's, I mean, I've said that I think there are 
some things you need to do domestically to try to make domestic policy do its job without impairing integration. I think the flip side of that is we need some new rules and new institutions in the world uh, that not just are stricter. I don't think what we need is stricter because people are already recoiling against uh, losing sovereignty to global institutions. But we need rather smarter rules and institutions, ones that will provide satisfaction to countries that feel that they've been aggrieved. I, I think we have to start with the WTO. Um, you know, m much of the complaint that one hears, and this is not just from the US, but from other countries as well, is that the WTO uh, has weaknesses, that some countries, China being one, but by no means the only one, came in when, as small economies, uh, they came in with transitional arrangements and various arrangements that allowed them to maintain policies that weren't consequential when they were small economies. China was about a trillion dollar economy in 2000, shortly after it came in. But that now when you're a 13 trillion dollar economy are very consequential to your trading partners. And there's no way in the WTO to smoothly to change that and to, 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 for a, a complaining country to get satisfaction that the, the rules will, will um, evolve as the member country's situation evolves. There are concerns that the dispute resolution mechanisms are not sufficiently um, working sufficiently to provide protections. I'm no expert on the WTO, but I think the, the uh, concerns are widely enough shared that the leaders of the, the G20 leaders at the meeting in Argentina last uh, December decided to reform the WTO. Now, nothing has been done, um, but I think that's the right goal. It's a complex matter given the, the governance structure of, of the WTO. I think we need uh, uh, perhaps to be thinking about international cooperation in other difficult areas, um, you know, uh, in terms of refugee and migration flows and how to help, it, how to have multilateral efforts to help people stay home and have a reason to stay home, but also rules and regulations about how people are treated when they, uh, are, when they do move. Um, you know, I, I think there are a range of uh, public goods that the world ought to be dealing with, whether it's dealing with better, like climate. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I think there's ample, whether someday there can be some kind of international cooperation on cybersecurity, I would, I think it, it looks very difficult to accomplish now, but perhaps the right answer is for like-minded countries to agree to some norms of behavior with respect to uh, uh, the cyber sphere. Uh, and that that would have to be organized in a multilateral setting as well. Mm. You're touching on climate, which has always struck me as a, a place that so many interests converge. I mean, if you look, um, business has actually very pro um, green tech, moving ahead with carbon trading, uh, things of that nature. China has made green technology a strategic priority. We're hearing about a green new deal here in the US. Um, Europeans have very uh, number of ways of dealing with this. Many emerging markets are interested in clean tech. How do we get everybody on board with making this a priority and possibly making that the basis um, of a, a new sort of goal setting and, and modernization of some of the institutions you're talking about? Yeah, I, look, I think as in, as in all the other areas I've talked about, so far the efforts have not come to fruition. And this one is, you know, I think we have to consider that this is one of very high priority uh, because the climate change uh, itself is advancing uh, with, and, and not being restrained appropriately. Um, you know, we, we're, doing, we're trying to do our part at the IMF by providing analysis and information on what it will take for countries to meet their um, climate change goals, uh, what it will take in terms of their own effort, how well they're doing, so we can provide that. Um, but, you know, the hardest part of this is for countries that really don't internalize the externality of the uh, climate change that's being generated or don't perceive the risks uh, as being close enough uh, at hand in time uh, that, it's very, that it's very, very hard. It would be, you know, it would be v very useful to have the United States leading 
uh, rather than uh, uh, staying uh, on the sidelines of this uh, uh, because of the size of the, the economy and how consequential the U.S. is. Um, you're putting me, as we talk about clean tech and, and, and the movement to new energy sources, you're, you're making me think about retraining. Um, you know, there, one of the ideas that's been posed in this country is should we retrofit uh, homes for new, techno new clean tech technologies and use that as an opportunity to upskill labor? There are so many um, headwinds coming now in the labor markets with AI, um, some of the digital technologies that may create plenty of jobs in the long term, but are going to create a tremendous amount of disruption in the short term. What can we do? What are, what, again, what are the opportunities that we're not seeing? Look, you're getting me out of the area of IMF expertise, so I will be modest and just say categories of, of things that I think we need to think about. Um, you know, I, I do think we need to get the pricing of energy right, of fossil fuels right, and that's been a shortcoming of the approach, uh, the various approaches uh, that have been used so far for climate. I think we need to have a better uh, assessment of um, the role of urbanization. There's clearly uh, energy uh, savings that can come through uh, smart uh, urbanization. I think uh, as in some other technological areas, we may find that the uh, advances come in poorer countries that are just urbanizing. And you know, if you can build a green city, it's a lot cheaper than, than uh, starting uh, to refit, retrofit uh, existing um, existing cities. Um, I think uh, that uh, having proper incentives for the development of some of the new technologies uh, uh, can help. I think you raise a very complex question and one we're beginning to think through but but by no means have gotten to uh, to a satisfactory point is on the the likely impact of AI on the future of work. Um, and that's going to affect most everything else that you that you spoke about, you know. <clears throat> whether, I mean, of course, we expect AI, where it's applied, to raise the productivity of the people who are who are working in conjunction with the AI. But at the same time, it will displace. Uh, and and this goes as well for um, uh, mechanization and robotization. But um, you know, the question is if if uh, the, the new technologies are. Uh, re are labor saving, are replacing people. Uh, there's a big question of what happens uh, in the rest of the economy. Now, whether there will be opportunities uh, uh, to put people to work in, uh, you know, building green cities, in dealing with climate change, in uh, adaptation, uh, surely some. Um, but how this all fits together, I think it's quite a, a big. Uh, big puzzle and we don't have all the puzzle pieces. I'm going to um, give folks an opportunity in just a couple of minutes to ask some questions. So if you want to think about them and we've got a couple of mics, you can get lined up um, and have a chance to do that. And in the meantime, let me ask you, David, you, you touched um, a little bit, uh, a, a couple of questions back on the idea of concentration of power, monopoly <coughs> power in the economy. Um, you and I ran into each other a few months ago at a dinner looking at blockchain technologies. Um, this is one of the kind of edgy solutions that people are talking about in terms of how can we make sure that wealth is shared, the technologies are easily accessed and spread. Can you talk a little bit about that? How, how can we make sure that we don't end up with even more concentration of power than we already do? And are there interesting technological solutions that you all are thinking about? Yeah. Well, we're looking at uh, fintech, the application of new technologies to the financial sector. And where I'd say two years ago, there was a lot of, uh, and perhaps last time you and I had a conversation uh, of this kind, there was a lot of uh, expectation around Bitcoin and distributed ledger technologies being disruptive. I think the disadvantages of those technologies now have uh, come to the fore. And uh, that's sort of recognized in the falling price of uh, Bitcoin. Rather, what we've seen is that the new technologies have, for the most part, been ad adopted by either by financial institutions or people who then sell services to financial institutions for the sake of low, creating efficiencies in payment systems and in the, the various things that banks and financial institutions do that are going to make banking and finance more profitable, faster, better user experience, and so on and so forth. 
but th those, and, and so to the extent that they are uh, ad adopted by incumbent institutions, they will strengthen those existing institutions, and this this won't be uh, the creation of uh, of a whole new of a whole new industry. But at the same time, at the event that we were at that you referred to, there is a whole other technological movement out there of people who are trying to create what they call a distributed internet, um, a very decentralized internet, one where individuals would have technology at their uh, disposal uh, in order to maintain control over all data that pertain to you, whether it's your financial data, your medical data, your photographs, any asset that you have of any kind. And the idea would be that because of the, with the use of, of technology to control your information, that if you were a seller and I were a buyer, I could buy from you without ever knowing you, without ever um, having to know anything about your reputation, because there would be a software that assured me that you were for real and ways for me to check your bona fides. This, in the, in the eyes of these uh, technologists, would in essence put out, out of business minor league intermediaries like Amazon. There might be a need for someone to deliver your good to me, but they just get paid to put it in a truck and bring it to me. They see this as more broadly potentially replacing financial institutions, replacing all sorts of incumbent institutions. This would be this kind of decentralized internet with, with, with would, would also, in their view, in, in their conception, solve the problem of data, that you could provide, say, to your doctor the data that he would need, he or she would need to treat the thing that you, the, the issue at the moment without transmitting everything about yourself and transmit it to that doctor in a way that they could never give it to anyone else, to an insurance company, to Facebook, or anyone else. So there would be a, a, re, a way for you to take, as they put it, custody over all data, data relevant to you. And this would be a, a much more disruptive technology and I think would be one in, in their conception that would be anti-concentration. It would lead to a much more decentralized uh, network of economic activity in the world. So as we move to more and more growth being in the digital area, it's clear that we're going to need lots of different frameworks for thinking about those new regulatory frameworks, possibly new tax frameworks. You all have done some work on, on corporate tax harmonization. Um, can yeah. you tell us how you're thinking about that and, right. and what you think the best practices should be? You know, I think we've observed the international tensions over corporate taxation in recent years. It's not knew that there's uh, tax competition, that some countries with low taxes attract either business or simply through the accounting, the pricing, uh, transfer pricing that puts profits in low tax jurisdictions. And the, as well, I think the, the U.S. tax reform showed that there are different approaches to uh, corporate taxation in different places. This is a sort of a fundamentally undesirable outcome in a world with very mobile capital and uh, in a world where uh, we want to see capital flow to the best uses for the benefit of those who uh, uh, can use it the best uh, and especially to developing uh, countries that uh, require more capital for, for growth and increasing living standards. And so we've written a paper that tries to lay out the, the, the pros and cons, the benefits of four different approaches to capital taxation, to corporate taxation. There's no one methodology that's uh, dominant. Uh, if there were, we'd, uh, we'd be uh, advocating for it. Um, but I think it's well worthwhile the uh, international community uh, taking this up and trying to think about whether uh, to have a to have a, uh, uh, a stronger global economy knit together better and, and to have stronger uh, uh, investment flows, uh, whether this, uh, this uh, work of ours should be turned into a reality. Okay. Um, we have time to maybe take a couple of questions if you want to step up to the mic and introduce yourself. 
Sure, my name is Dion Rabowen. I'm a reporter at Axios. Uh, I'm wondering about how the political element and the changes that we're seeing in, uh, in politics globally factor into the way you all make your projections for economic growth. Uh, so I'm talking about not only sort of the the changes in democracy, you see uh, Germany isn't able to form a government, Netherlands not able to form a government, the US not really being able to pass a budget for years. In addition, you're seeing growing autocracies, folks like Erdogan in Turkey, you've got <coughs> Trump here in the US, AMLO, we could go on and on. How do those changes factor into the way that you all put together your, your projections and how you expect growth to change going forward? It's a really good question. Well, I mean, we're not, uh, uh, political scientists, but we do bear the burden of do, doing the best assessment we can in any individual case of how uh, a country's policymakers are likely to go about setting policy and uh, and and how that's going to work out. But allow me, though, just one observation, which is, I'm not sure that it's a coincidence that we're seeing uh, leaders have a difficult time satisfying their populations when the global uh, situ when the global system is perceived by people as being as causing disruption i mean if in essence in an open economy world a leader doesn't really have the policy levers to solve the problems that are troubling his people his or her people then there's going to be a lot of dissatisfaction and uh, uh, I think, in, in a way, uh, much more of an onus on, on, on leaders. The, the, prob the point, though, is the answer is not to retreat to uh, domestic approaches and solutions that uh, lead you to give up on global integration and give up on the gains from trade and, and finance. I think the answer is, through institutions like the IMF and through fora like the G20 to try to solve the global problems so that you can go back home and say, I fixed the problem. I, 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 I can't fix it at home because it's not a domestic problem. It's a, it's a problem that stems from uh, the way the world is organized. But if you could come home someday and say, we've now got an international corporate tax system that works without base erosion and profit shifting, then you've got something to say that's meaningful. Yeah. Question over here. Thank you. Raghubir Goyal, I'm with India Globe and Asia. Today I cover the White House. My question is, every year I ask the same question. Corruption, how big is the corruption problem around the globe? People are asking this question for the last 70 yeah. years from the World Bank and IMF. Whatever the World Bank and IMF gives money, it goes to the governments, not to the people. It's not reaching most of the time to the people. And finally, how India is doing today as far as econo economically and because one of the major members of the yep. World Bank, IMF. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on India, I think India is doing uh, very well from the standpoint of uh, growth. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we are projecting a continued strong growth there. I think on corruption, on, on how big is corruption, actually this year we have some answers for you. I would urge people to read in the fiscal monitor the second chapter, which is uh, looking at the question of how, there are many issues around corruption. This looks specifically at the question of what does corruption do to public finances? I mean, you can imagine that if uh, that corruption can undermine public finances in a lot of ways, uh, the, the loss of revenues, the loss of economic activity, uh, the diversion of spending from efficient uses. And I think, uh, you know, we, we have in there some estimates that show really quite a substantial uh, impact of corruption on uh, public finances, loss of several points of GDP. Uh, we also look at what would happen uh, if countries, and this is not an easy thing, so we're not saying it's going to happen sometime soon, but if, if countries that really have not been successful at curbing corruption could get, say, to the average uh, anti-corruption effort position of, say, OECD countries. And it's really quite, it would lead to quite, quite substantial improvements in public finances and in growth. So I think, I, I, I strongly recommend those of you who are interested in this uh, to take a look at that chapter. We are stepping up our efforts on a country by country basis to talk to uh, our members about corruption in their particular cases. I think you all have to understand that it's difficult to go in and talk about 
corruption when in a government where one believes that the government is party to the corruption, but we're doing that anyway. Uh, but uh, we have a number of uh, country programs where we've helped countries build uh, new and important anti-corruption institutions. This is an effort where, where, where we've begun in the last several years, but we're just getting started. Let me ask you in just the two or three minutes that we have left um, to go through and maybe think about some black swans, both on the positive and the negative side that we haven't talked about. Where are some risks that we haven't covered? And what are some potential upside positives that, that we might yeah. see? Well, I think the, the biggest upside positive is the technology. You know, as uh, the famous uh, quote of uh, MIT economics professor Robert Solo, he was saying uh, way back when that the, the new computer technology was showing up everywhere except in the productivity numbers. Um, you know, we see technological change around us everywhere. And we, we experience it every day. And we see new things on the horizon, AI and 5G. 5G, they say, will mean your, your devices will be a thousand times faster. The que but we don't see uh, an acceleration of global growth. So, the, you know, the, there, that raises the question, is this about mismeasurement? Is this about... Uh, the technology being used for something other than growth, or is it that we just haven't gotten to the point where the technologies are being used for the things that will generate growth? Mm. That was the experience with electricity in the late 19th century, early 20th century. That was the experience with computers. We'll have to see. But that, that's the, the, big, the big upside is that uh, uh, technology will provide us with all sorts of things, including coming back to one of the harder subjects we talked about, um, a way through the climate, uh, the climate change subject through the use of um, uh, technologies that don't, uh, don't contribute to climate, to the energy technologies that don't contribute to climate change. You know, on the downside, I guess uh, we all, in, in light of history, the, the worst outcome, uh, I think, is uh, uh, political conflict that interferes with uh, the f functioning of this global economy that we've had for the 75 years of the Bretton Woods period um, and interferes with the growth prospects of uh, developing countries. Okay, well you've said 2019 is going to be a delicate year, so um, we go. will we'll reevaluate a year from now okay. and maybe call it new, new challenges. <laughs> all right, thank you all for being here. Thanks to you, David. Thank you.